Lord will come to catch his bride away. With lamps of and burning, we yearn for his returning. With earnest zeal, we labor hard to pray. Yes, this could be the year when our Savior will appear, and all the saints of God will be caught up in the air. The heavens we praise will ring when we greet our Lord and King, and this could be the year when. Christ comes. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Amen. It certainly would be to me. Um, I, I don't have anything in this world that I hold on to so tightly. Nothing that means so much that um, I would, would, would not gladly give it up to be able to be with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. It would be a great day. Hey, it's good to see you out on this Wednesday night. I'm glad that you're here. How many of you are a little bit tired? I mean, just honestly, you're a little bit tired. Okay, so um, tonight, in order to help with that, what we're going to do is I'm going to preach sitting down and you all are going to stand for the entire... No, I'm just kidding. Not really. <laughs> but if I look out and see eyelids start closing, then I might have to do something drastic. It's either that or uh, throw hymn books at you so you know you kind of have the choice. You like, you like the hymn books being thrown at you better. Okay. Hey, let's turn to the book of Colossians tonight. And we're going to look together at Colossians chapter number 2 and look at a truth that is a basic truth and a good truth and I trust will be an encouragement and a help and a blessing. And I'll tell you, um, just in transparency, that I have struggled tonight with exactly what the Lord would have me to speak on. There are several things on my heart and mind. Thankfully, we do have tomorrow and Thursday, but I know that because of distance and, and other issues, some may not be able to make it over to the Miami Beach um, services. And so um, I'm torn a little bit because I have, I have some things that are on my heart for you all that I'd like to be able to say to you, and uh, with just tonight left here, I hope that you can come tomorrow night, is what I'm saying, and Friday night. If there's any way you can make it over to the Miami Beach services, they'll be at 7 o'clock. If you need help with getting there, then talk to Pastor, either directions or arrive. Talk to Pastor, and he'll be able to get you connected with what, what it is that you need to know. But I'm glad that you're here tonight. All right. Colossians chapter 2. And by the way, let me just say this for those, again, in case I'm not able to see those of you who are here, um, for those who um, the Lord moved and you gave in the offering, whatever it is, it's enough, and I'm very grateful. Thank you. We don't take for granted that people give in order to allow my family to continue to travel on and preach. I don't ever, I don't ever want to get to the place where I travel just for the sake of getting enough to be able to continue to travel. That's not the reason why we do what we do, but... Uh, practically speaking and biblically speaking it is what God has ordained in order for us to be able to do the things that we do and if we had to, if we had to get a job in order to support ourselves to travel on occasion then I'd do it in a heartbeat it's not a problem at all whatever God wants me to do doesn't bother me a bit but I'm very grateful that folks like you and you all have given in order to make it possible for us to travel so thanks sincerely I'm very grateful to you all right, Colossians chapter number 2. We're going to begin reading in verse number 6 in just a moment. And we're going to read all the way down through verse number 10. 
All of these are great verses packed with both uh, very, don't, don't be afraid of the word, but doctrinal truth, that is, it, it teaches something very specific, and then also very practical things about how to live the way that God would have us to live, to live as um, victorious in Jesus Christ, as we sang about earlier in the service. So, let me pray, and then we'll stand together and look at these verses. You can stay seated while I talk to the Lord, and then in a moment, if you're physically able, I'll invite you to stand with me. Father, I love you. I thank you so much for the privilege to be able to look at your word tonight. God, I'm grateful for the nation in which we live, uh, where we have the freedom to be able to do this. I'm thankful for these folks who have gathered together, who have uh, a heart that is desirous to hear from you. And God, if we're going to be changed into the image of your son, then it is going to happen because we hear from you tonight. And so please do, God. Help me to be able to say the things that are going to be helpful to those who have gathered together tonight. And if there are things that I'm not planning on saying that would be that would be good for us to hear, then put it in my heart and my mind and help me to know it's from you. And if there's things that I'm thinking to say but they wouldn't be helpful to our situation, then Father, please, please help me to be aware of that as well. Again, I love you. Thank you for the time that we can have together. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask these things. Amen. All right, if you're physically able, stand with me, please. And let's look together at Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 6, and then reading down through verse number 10. I'll read it out loud. You follow along uh, silently. If I, if I give a dramatic pause or I ask you to read a word or a phrase, then just, just jump in. All right, Colossians 2, verse number 6. The Bible says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in who? Him. In him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any Amen. spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Hey, thanks for standing. You may be seated. Do you know what an epistle is? It's not the wife of an apostle, just in case that's what you were thinking. An epistle is a term that we use to describe a letter that was written by one of the apostles, um, and it was a letter most often, as far as what we have recorded in the scriptures for us, it was most often a letter that was either written to a church, sometimes to a, an individual, but most often um, to a church. Anybody know who wrote the, uh, the largest number or the highest number of letters that are recorded in the scripture that are epistles to either churches or individuals? Anybody know the human author? Obviously, God is the one who gave us the scriptures, but he used a human author, and there's one apostle in particular that God used more than any of the others. Anybody have any idea? Paul. Okay, the apostle Paul. How, how many of you already knew that already? How many of you just learned that for the first time? How many of you refuse to raise your hand no matter what questions I ask? Okay, <laughs> right. all right. So, the apostle Paul was a uh, writer that God used to write letters and he would write to different churches or individuals. And oftentimes, when the Apostle Paul wrote these letters, he would write in order to correct issues that were going on. You've got to understand that these churches that these letters were originally written to were churches that were brand new to the faith. That is, brand new to what it meant to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it's not as if um, these people who, who, who were in these churches had grown up going to church all their life. They had because there weren't churches before this point. This, this was all brand new stuff to them. They knew nothing about what to do, how to do it. They were coming out. All the people that, that made up the congregations of, of these churches came out of either other religions or else the Jews' religion that did not accept Jesus Christ as Savior. So, it just stands to reason that along the way of trying to follow the Lord, they would run into bumps. That is, they would make mistakes. Are, are you aware of the fact that sometimes people make mistakes? Did you, did you know that? 
Um, do you know anybody that has ever made a mistake before? Yeah, okay, can you point at them right now? All right, obviously, all of us have. And that's, that's certainly true for these people. So the Apostle Paul was used by God to write these letters and correct things that were going on. Now, sometimes he would just teach them things that they were confused about. And then sometimes the churches that he wrote to made some mistakes that they knew better. There's a difference. And the Apostle Paul, oftentimes in his letters, would write in order to correct an issue. And in some of the letters, he wrote fairly uh, straightforwardly by saying things along the lines of, look, you guys need to take care of the issues that are going on right now because those things aren't right. And in the case of one letter in particular that I'm thinking of to a church in the city of Corinth, he said, you guys either take care of the issue or else when I come to you, I'm going to come with a rod in my hand. Meaning, I'm going, to, I'm going to growl at you a little bit if you don't take care of the issue because they were doing things that they weren't supposed to do. They knew it. Paul knew it. And so he writes this letter. Okay. So oftentimes, Paul writes letters and correct issues. However, in this letter that we just read from, in, in this book of Colossians, it was, a, it was a letter written to a church in a city called Colossae. When you look at this letter, you don't see you don't see correction issues going on. In other words, Paul doesn't write to these people and say, "Hey, don't do this, don't do this. You know better than that. Fix this, or else when I come, mm, it's not going to be good." He doesn't do that. The attitude of the apostle Paul to the people to whom he's writing is, "Hey, you guys are doing really well. You guys obviously want to follow the Lord." Now he says, "Let me instruct you on how to do it a little bit better." Let me teach you some things that you need to know and remind you of some things that I told you before in order that you may be able to follow the Lord Jesus Christ the way that He wants you to and to be as, uh, as successful at it as you possibly can be. Obviously, I don't know the hearts of the people who are here tonight. I don't know your heart. I could, just like you don't know my heart. But I'm guessing, I'm just guessing, that you are here tonight because you have at least some interest in what it is that God has for you. I mean, it's a Wednesday night. Not, there, you, you wouldn't have to come. Nobody's going to come and beat down your door and drag. Well, Pastor might, but I wouldn't do that. It, 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 I, I am guessing that for most of you in this, in this room right now, you're here because at least a little bit on the inside, you have a desire of, okay, what does God want for me? Okay, then this passage is going to be absolutely dynamite for you. If you'll come into this service tonight with the attitude of the Colossians and say, all right, I want to follow Jesus Christ. I want to live victory in Jesus. I want God to speak to me and to use me. I want, as we mentioned last night, to hear my Lord and Savior say someday, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Then you want to hear what, what the Apostle Paul writes to these, these people. He says in verse number 6, this is his instruction. This is, hey, here's how you increase. Here's guidance. He says to them, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. And the word as means in the same manner or in the same way. So think, think with me. He says, in the same way that you received Christ Jesus the Lord. And then he gives the instruction here. He says, so in that same way, walk ye in him. Okay, now let me ask you a question. And uh, you, can, you can answer it out loud if you know it. What, what is the way that we walk in Christ Jesus the Lord? Same way we received Him. Okay. And how do we receive Him? Freely. Let me, let, me, let me give you a verse and you fill in the blank and, and see if we can uh, see how it makes sense here. For by grace are you saved through? Faith. Okay. Do you, you understand that there's no way to receive Jesus Christ but by faith? When the Bible talks about receiving Jesus Christ, it's talking about accepting Him for who He is and that what He did was enough for you. And there's no way to receive Jesus Christ by faith. In other words, it's not possible for me to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt in a, uh, in a physical way that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It, I mean, is it? Well, let me ask you. Is Jesus Christ the Son of the God? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Can you take a sample of his blood, and put it under a microscope, look at the DNA, and somehow see deity in that blood? Is that how we know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? 
Is that, is, that, is that what gives us our confidence? Okay, no, no. It's not as if I can look at his blood and know from his DNA that he is the Son of God. And yet we do know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. How is it that we know that? And the answer is, we've received it by... Okay, now don't think to yourself, well, that's just a blind faith in the sense that uh, Christians believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but Muslims believe something different, and Hindus believe something different, and all of these religions are on the same level. They all take things at a blind faith. No, no, no. If, you're, if, if that is your way of thinking, then friend, you're, you're misunderstanding, you're misinterpreting everything that we see in the Scripture. There are so many things that point to the fact that this book is true and divinely given. Because of time tonight, I don't have the ability to, to give to you the reasons right now. But I will tell you, if you do any research or any reading or any studying at all, you will find that this book over and over and over and over again proves itself to be divine, to be special. Then it stands to reason, because this book is true, that what it says is true. And in the Bible, God says that Jesus Christ is His Son. And Jesus Christ made the claim that He and the Father are one. Jesus Christ claimed to be the Son of the God. So we know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God because the Bible says it, and we have received it by... Okay, because there's no other way to receive Jesus Christ but by faith. Let me ask you another question. Does the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanse away sin, yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay, so let me ask again. Is it possible for me to take a sample of his blood, put it under a microscope, and see some kind of cleaning agent, some detergent in it that is like specifically designed for taking away sin? Is, is, that, is that how we know that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ can cleanse away sin? Is that how we know? No. How do we know that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is powerful enough to take away sin? And the answer is, we've received it by... Okay, the Bible says it. God claims it. You may say, yes, but I've experienced it. Okay, but your experience is based upon what you received by... Because there's no other way to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Who He is, or that what He did is, is enough to take away our sins unless you receive it by faith. That is... You accept that what God says is so, and you depend on Him to do what it is that He said He'll do. Jesus Christ claimed to be the Son of God. The Bible says His blood was enough to take care of my sin. We read in the Scriptures that He was buried and He rose again three days later. All of this we have accepted or received by faith. And we placed our dependence on Him. At least I did as a young man. I placed my dependence on Christ. And at that moment, God saved me. I received Jesus Christ. And I received Him by... Faith. Okay. So here, back at the verse. Verse number 6. In the same way that you received Christ Jesus the Lord, which is by... Faith. Believing that what God says about Him is so. And trusting Him to do what He says He'll do. Now, the Bible says, or so, walk ye in Him. In the same way, walk ye in Him. So how is it I'm supposed to walk in Him? And the answer is by? Faith. All right. So when the Bible talks about walking by faith, what, what is this? Well, um, the idea of walking is obviously taking steps. Uh, the journey of a thousand miles begins with? Single, single step. One step, the first step many different uh, ways to say the phrase, but all of it comes back to uh, a journey is made up of just single steps. A life, your life, my life, is made up of individual decisions. You do know this, don't you? Your life is not made up of wants, wishes, dreams, desires. Your life is made up of choices. And the choices that you make end up directing you in a way, in a path, and that path determines where you end up in life. In other words, who you are now as a person, as a vocation, in your family, all of that is, is built upon choices that you have made, right? Remember, I don't know if it was last night or the other night, I talked about my imagination of wanting to go from portly to, to uh, strong all in a moment. Well, it doesn't happen. How does that happen? Well, the way that you go from being large to in shape is on Wednesday night you weigh in. <laughs> you see? And you join the... Large, large losers. 
large <laughs> lard losers or whatever, and then you go home and after you join the large lard losers, you get a bowl of ice cream. Amen. <laughs> Is that how it works? No. Obviously not. If, if, you're, if a person's going to lose weight, they're going to lose weight because they make choices. Um, if a person is going to learn, they make choices, uh, they make choices in life to help that. In other words, uh, I'm, I, I can't go home and watch entertainment on television and, and then all of a sudden end up brilliant about um, whatever it is that I need to learn about. It, does, it doesn't work that way. In other words, my, the choices I make determine where I end up. Here, here's an illustration I've oftentimes used, especially with young people, so um, maybe it'll strike home with you as well. Let's say that I'm standing up uh, in front of you right now, and um, I, I, get up to, I get up to preach, and I say, hey, take your Bible and turn to Colossians chapter 2. And as soon as I say that, I fall over on the ground, and I start shaking around a little bit, and then I just stop. And all of a sudden, through the back door, a 16-year-old girl comes to the door and she says, Hey, everybody stand still. Everybody stay where you are. I have always wanted to be a heart surgeon. It's been my dream and my desire since I was a kid to be a heart surgeon. And it looks like to me that Brother Tim has had a heart attack. And so she comes up <coughs> and she sees me on the floor. She kicks me over and goes, Yep, I'm sure of it. Heart attack. So I'm going to do heart surgery. Does anybody have a knife? Anybody have a scalpel? Anybody have a shovel, uh, an axe, a, a pitchfork? Anything like that, I need to do surgery. Well, at this point, I miraculously revive and head out the back door. Why? Because no 16-year-old girl is going to do heart surgery on me if I can help it. If, if she wants to do heart surgery on me, then she needs to make really good grades in high school and go to college for like 12 years and make really good grades in college and then work with another heart surgeon for a while, and then do heart surgery on all of you. And if you live, then she can do heart surgery on me. Well, somebody says, but Tim, her dream, isn't his, her desire, her dream is to become a heart surgeon. Isn't that enough? No, no it's not. You don't become a heart surgery because you want to, because you dream about it. You become a heart surgeon because you make choices, and the same thing is true in life. When the Bible says that I'm to walk in Him, in Christ. The idea is I'm, I'm to make the choices of my life not, not based on the things that I, that I can always just see around me or certainly the way that I feel or based upon the information that is fed to me from the outside. But the Bible says, Paul is speaking to people who are saying they want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and he's saying, okay, you want to? You want to increase you want to be everything that God has for you to be? Then let me tell you what you do. Just like you received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you believe that what God said about Him was true, and you trusted Him to save you from your sin. All right, now you live your life in that same faith. You believe for your life everything that God has to say to you. And you trust Him to take care of everything. You believe God. You take God at His word. In fact, the very next verse, verse number 7 says, here's, here's, here's practically how it works out. Look at verse number 7. He says here, get rooted and built up in Him. Let me ask you a question. Who's Him? You can answer it out loud. Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay, it's Christ Jesus. Rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Okay, time out real quickly. Now, um, when I hear the words rooted and built up, Rooted specifically, immediately, uh, well, let me ask you, just, just because I can tell people a little bit tired, so keeping you engaged with me will be helpful. What is it, what is it that comes to your mind when you hear the word rooted? What, what picture do you have come to your mind? Plants. Plants, Plants trees, vegetation of some sort. Okay, rooted, because a plant grows as the roots go, go down and get the nutrients out of the soil and from the water that it needs in order to be able to strengthen and grow. Okay, so when the Bible says, I'm to be rooted... In Christ, um, what what's that what's that about? How how do I get how do I get rooted into Jesus Christ? Well, I think the answer to that is found in John one. You don't need to turn there, but maybe you can fill in the blank for me. In the beginning was the word. capital W O R D, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
When the Bible speaks about Jesus Christ, it refers to Him as the Word, the living Word. And here we have the written Word. Everything here comes from God is about the Lord Jesus Christ. So that, and this is true, if I'm going to get rooted and built up in Christ, if I'm going to get rooted and built up in Him, then that means I'm going to dig into what the Bible has to say, what God has to say, so that I know how to live by faith. This is the way to live by faith. I get rooted, and then the Bible says, and, and built up. That is, I take, I take what, what I read, and it becomes a part of my life. To just read it, hear it, and say, oh, I believe that's true, but then not to add it to my life is not living by faith. You, you can have all kinds of knowledge about the Bible. You can quote scriptures. You can know all kinds of things about the Bible. But if it doesn't become a part of your life, then friend, you may be doing a lot of things. You may have an air or a show of religiousness, but you don't have living faith. You don't have a faith to live by because living by faith comes as I root into Jesus Christ and then I, I get that into my life and it becomes a part of me. And then the Bible says, and I'm established in the faith. Set. Established. Feet spread. Ready. Um, when I was in high school, I had a good friend whose name was John Thacker. John Thacker in the 10th grade weighed about 300, about 300 pounds. Maybe 280 to 300. He was a, he was a big boy and it weren't all muscle. Um, John, John and I were good friends. We loved to play sports together. I remember one time in particular, I attended a small, a small Christian school. John Thacker and I, we had a, our school had this outing where all the guys were going to go stay overnight at some camp or something like that. And we met, and usually at school, we, we, we loved to play football, but we weren't allowed to play tackle football because they were afraid of us getting hurt. <laughs> um, and so we got together this night, and we decided we were going to play football, and we said, we're not at school. So we could play tackle football. This is going to be great. So we divided up on the two teams. John Thacker was on one team. I was on the other team. Um, we kicked the ball off. John Thacker received it. Not the fastest guy to run the football down the field, but he was big and not a lot of people were going to be able to tackle it. John was running down the field. And I can, I can remember, this is, this is like one of those times where something happens in a split moment, but, but your mind remembers it in much longer time. John was running down the field. I was running towards John. And I remember seeing John have the football in his hand. And I remember seeing him grab it, put it up in the air, and like running around people like this. And I was coming at John. And I thought to myself, just in a moment, I thought, you know what? If I hit him hard enough, I bet you he drops the football. So I'm coming up. John has his head turned the opposite direction. Doesn't see me coming puts the ball up in the air, up on one foot, and just as he goes up on one foot, with everything that I had in my 180-pound body, I hit John as hard as I could. I mean, I just pile-drived him. Well, he's a big boy. He went flying one way, I went flying the other way. I do not know if there were stars out that night, but both of us saw. We were, both of us were lying on our backs, looking up at the sky, when we came to, and by the way, he did drop the ball and we recovered, so it was well worth it. But we, we were both lying on the ground, and when I, when I opened my eyes, all the guys that were playing the game had gathered around looking at us and going, Dude! That was awesome! And we were going, oh yeah, that was, that was great. All right, so this is one of those once-in-a-lifetime kind of hits. And it really did, honestly. I mean, John was my friend, but it felt really good to hit somebody as hard as you could. It was. A couple weeks later, in school, we were playing football. And we were playing, well, because we couldn't play tackle, we played two-hand touches, not quite enough, which is a kind way to say we're playing tackle football without really playing tackle football. And the same situation presented itself, only this time instead of John Thacker, it was a 160 pound kid <laughs> coming with, with the ball. And I was coming, I was coming across the field again. And when I was about five feet from him, he turned and he looked at me. He grabbed the ball and he went down like this and I hit Matt. Just, I mean, I just, bam, hit him just as hard as I had hit John Thacker. Just ran into him just as hard as I could. And this time, Matt kind of stumbled even fallen. I bounced off. Well, after it happened, I looked at him and I went, what, 
What was that about? I mean, I hit 280 pounds worth of John Thacker and he goes flying. I hit 160 pounds worth of Matt and he stays up. How does this happen? Okay, well, the difference was that John Thacker had the ball up in the air and he was up on one foot. Matt, feet set, ball held, hunched down, ready for the hit, was, a, was able to handle it. Okay, now look. Silly illustration that illustrates what the Bible says when it says established in the faith. Here, here's the idea. The idea is, and this, this is important, as I read and learn what the scriptures have for me, as I see what the Bible says, and I, and I add it to my life, then the Bible says I'm supposed to get established in the faith. By the way, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by thee. Okay, so I'm back to the scriptures again. So I'm reading what the Bible says all about the Lord Jesus Christ, about, about what he wants for me, about what he says is right and good, about everything, about friends, about finances, about life in general, about how I handle my time, about what I live for, about what my mindset is supposed to be, and I'm supposed to get set or established in the faith. Why is that? Why do I get set and established in the faith? Because, because there is so much out there. That, that Satan would love to be able to catch you up on one foot, not really solidly founded on what the Bible has to say. And Satan knows full well that if he can come at full speed and hit you when you're not established, set in what the Bible says and what the truth is, he knows he can knock you off course so easily and stop you from being able to run and live and walk by faith. So Satan will do anything he can to sideline you. And so the Bible here says, look, you want to live by faith, you get rooted and built up in Christ, that is, in, in his word, in a relationship with him, established, set in the faith. Hey, by the way, let me just say this real quickly. Because there's a, there, there are a, I don't, please understand, I don't mean this as a, uh, I'm not trying to purposely down someone else or any other group. But there are a lot of churches out there that, that work at emotionally stirring people up and they emphasize your experience and in doing so they de-emphasize the importance of the scriptures. Experience is not a problem. But we don't we, our faith is not built upon experience. Because Muslims have experience. Hindus have experiences. Satan can provide an experience so that the scriptures become the solid foundation upon which we are supposed to set ourselves so that my experience needs to match up with the Bible. On occasion, um, pastors and preachers will run into people who will say, well, I'm just really convinced. I prayed about it, and I'm just really convinced I'm supposed to, and then they'll mention something that is contrary to Scripture. They'll talk about relationships or what they're going to do with their money or whatever, and it's contrary, I mean, specifically contrary to what the Scripture has to say. And they'll say, I just really feel... I just really feel like it's what I'm supposed to do. I prayed about it, and I just really feel like it's what I'm supposed to do. Hey, now listen. Listen. Your feelings make a great follower in faith, but not the leader if you're going to live by faith. That's right. Living by faith begins by my being rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as I have been taught, abounding there and with thanksgiving. That is, I believe that what God says is so. Okay, now let me say this real quickly. Oh, man. Let me say this real quickly. <clears throat> Living by faith is easy when, when it is something that doesn't, that doesn't push against my natural tendencies. Okay, let's let's do a little bit of honesty. And if you're not if you're not comfortable answering this, you don't need to. But but let me ask anyway. How many of you um, how many of you don't struggle with worrying about finances? Like like that's just not it's just not a I mean it's not something that you it's not something you need to think about. Not because you have so much. It's just not something that you're super super concerned about. Anybody you're built that way? Okay, there, there are several of you. It's just not it's just not a worry for you. Um, how many of you? 
Um, if somebody doesn't like you, I mean, you're not being mean, but it really doesn't matter. I mean, doesn't it doesn't matter? It's like water off a duck's back. It just doesn't it doesn't matter to you. Anybody built that built that way? Okay, all right. So people are people are built differently. Every, everybody has strengths and weaknesses in these kind of things. Okay. When the Bible says to live by faith and live according to the Word of God, it does speak to how I, how I, what I do with my finances. In other words, God says to me, Tim, I want you to be a giver. Uh, money is given to us to live and to give. Um, so I have enough to live by, and then I'm supposed to care about other people. I'm supposed to have so that I can give to him that needeth. That's what, that's what the book of uh, Ephesians, yes? I think so, Ephesians says. Uh, so, so for me, Honestly, for me, most of the time, on occasion it changes, but for me, most of the time, finances is not something that I worry greatly about. So for me to live by faith in the area of finances, to live and to give, okay, sure, not a problem. However, as soon as it turns to something that I struggle a little bit more with, then... Living by faith can have a little bit of teeth to it. This, this may, may or may not surprise you. It doesn't really matter. Um, I don't like confrontation at all. I don't like confrontation. I, don't, I, I want everybody to like me. Everybody. I, I, like, I, like to, I like it when we can just be one big happy family and get along. I think it's just great, you know, you like me and I like you and everything. Okay, so that if in living by faith and according to the word of God, because it's my responsibility to help people grow, and sometimes in helping people grow, there's confrontation that has to happen. Like, like I have to go to somebody and say, hey, look, this, is, this really isn't right. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Okay, well then, <clears throat> living by faith means I believe that what God says is so, and I trust him for the power to do it, and I have to step out in faith to do what he's told me to do, trusting God to take care of it. Okay, so when you live by faith, sometimes it has teeth to it. Okay, the next verse, verse number 8, gives us one quick warning and then our time is finished. Look, look, look at it. Verse number 7 tells us how to live by faith. Verse 8 says this. It, it begins by saying, beware. In other words, hey, heads up, watch out. Hey, careful, careful. Beware lest any man spoil you. Time out, real quickly. Spoil. You guys know what it means to spoil? Okay. Um, Think of it in war. Spoil. Most often when we hear the word spoil, we think of grandparents. That's not the right kind of thinking. I mean, spoiling as a grandparent, oftentimes when we think of spoiling as a grandparent, then we think of a grandparent giving their, giving their grandchildren things, right? I mean, that's kind of what we think. Here, uh, here's, a, here's a mom and dad, and they, they have, for, for three years, they have poured into their child important things like, make sure you eat your vegetables before you eat your dessert. And don't climb on the furniture and always pick up your toys before you go play with something else. And, and as a parent, for, I mean, for the first three years of a child's life, you pour yourself into them, teaching, these, the, teaching them these three things. Then you send them off to grandma and grandpa's. And when they're grandma and grandpa's, grandma and grandpa say, hey, look, hey, have a cookie. Not a big deal. We'll, we'll eat our vegetables later. You have a cookie right now. And then they say, hey, we can do flips. Let's take the cushions off the couch. We'll jump off the couch onto the cushions. This will be fun. And then Grandma says, hey, look, I'll, I'll clean up the toy room later. You guys just go have a good time. And after a week with Grandma, they come back home, and you say, they have been spoiled. Grandma gave them everything they wanted, and now I have to retrain my child. Okay, oftentimes we think of spoiling as giving, when in reality what takes place is a grandparent takes out of the mind of that child everything that is right and good and replaces it with wicked, awful Terrible, speaking, awful things like what grandparents do. All right, so spoiling actually means to take, not to give. So when the Bible says, beware or watch out lest any man spoil you, Paul is saying, just be aware, beware, be aware that there are people who will take from you that which is right out of your mind. Okay, Christians, believers, what is it that they would take? What is it that people can take from out of your mind? What way of living could they take 
It, it's a way of living by faith where I'm rooted and established in the scriptures, in the Bible. And the, and the Bible warns us. It says, be aware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Smart people that don't believe God. Uh, philosophy and vain deceit, empty lies. After the tradition of men, the way dad always did it, the way we've always done it. After the rudiments of the world, that is the teaching of the world and not after Christ. And then the Bible reminds us towards the end of this passage, for in Christ all the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells. That, that is, remember who's in charge. Remember who the, who the example is. Remember who it is that we serve. And then it gives us a statement of confidence. And I love it. Verse number 10 says, And ye are complete in Him. Okay, let me just say real quickly, and then our time is finished. When the Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you, what it means is, my eyes need to be alert. My mind needs to be awake to the fact that it is possible for the right things of the scripture to be taken from my mind so that I need to guard who it is and what it is that I allow it to influence, influence me. If I fill my mind and my heart with things that are worldly and meaningless or just junk-filled, if I watch everything that comes out of Hollywood on television and then expect to be able to think and live biblically, forgive me, that is absolute ignorance. Because there's no way that I can let that fill my mind and at the same time think and live, and live what the scriptures would have me think and live. I can either live by faith or I can live by my feelings and by my senses, but I can't do both at the same time. It just, it just doesn't work. So the Apostle Paul writes this letter and he says, look, brothers and sisters, hey, you guys want to follow Christ? Let me tell you what to do. The way it's going to happen is, remember how you, how, remember how you accepted Jesus Christ? How, you remember you trusted Him as a Savior and you did this by faith? Now, live that same way. Live by faith. Believe what He says about everything. Walk by faith. Get rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith. And He says, watch out. Don't let people who don't love God and would like to pull the right things out of your mind, don't let them influence you. They're good at it. Man, they can make it entertaining. Yeah, it can be real interesting. But it will absolutely be devastating to your life of faith if you follow that way as opposed to following the way of Christ, the way of faith. So, all that being said, as we want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, let me just ask you, don't answer out loud or raise your hand, but just think. Are you rooted and built up in Christ, or are you being rooted and built up in Christ? That is, do you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus that's alive, that's vivacious, that's growing, that's increasing? Are you, are you in His Word and learning what He has to say for you? And are you, are you adding it to your life? And are you getting set and established regardless of what else may come? This is what I'm going to follow the Lord regardless of what may push against me. Is that, is that where you're living? Are you aware of the other influences that, that could come in and steal that from your mind? And pushing those things away? Remember, it's Jesus Christ that died for us, not Hollywood. We're complete in Christ. It is Christ who is our all in all. It is Him who is our everything. And it is Him that we are to follow, love, and have a relationship with. And may God help us to live a life by faith. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, please, dear God, that you would take this truth from Colossians 2 and drive it in, into our hearts and minds and consciences and make us aware, dear God, of anything specifically. Now, there's so much application in this passage, uh, um, I think, of education and entertainments. I think of how easily we get drawn into things that are interesting, but they're filled with ungodliness, and things that are against you, and we're not even aware that that which is right and holy 
is being stripped away from the way that we think and we're becoming okay and calloused to things that are of the world and, and we have all kinds of justifications and reasons for it. And we're not actively um, seeking to get established in the faith in the truth of your word, walking with you and reading your word and following it. And, uh, and then in some cases where you have directed us by your word and by your spirit into some specific activity, we've not been stepping out in the faith and, and acting in obedience to what you've said. Dear God, I pray that tonight you would impress on our hearts the importance, the necessity of living by faith. You saved us from our sins for eternity. Help us to trust you with the lives that you've given to us, please. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask. Now, friend, tonight I have a couple of questions real quickly before we go. Number one, I wonder if there's some tonight who would say, again, by an upraised hand, knowing that I'll not embarrass you, I wonder if there are some tonight who would say, Tim, I don't know, or I have not yet, by faith received Jesus Christ for who He is and trusted Him uh, and what He did on the cross to be enough for me. I, I've never accepted Jesus Christ by faith to be my Savior. I've never put my trust in Him, but I would like to or I have questions about it. If that's true for you tonight, would you raise your hand where you sit? I have not yet trusted Christ as Savior, but I'd like to or I have questions about it. Anybody I can pray for regarding this? I'll wait just for a moment. Okay. I'll be glad to pray for you, absolutely. Others say the same? Second question. How many tonight would say, Brother Tim, as a believer, I've accepted Jesus Christ by faith for my salvation, but tonight, from the Scriptures, I see the importance of getting rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith. Or I see how important it is for me to be aware of... of things or people that can steal from my mind that which is right. And I have some decisions, specific decisions, that need to be made in regards to my living by faith. And you'd say, tonight, my desire is that this would be a turning point and I begin in my life to live by faith in whatever area God has revealed to me. And you'd say, Brother Tim, please pray with me and for me about it. Is there anybody like that tonight? I have some specific areas. Okay, wow, a number of hands. God bless you. Good, good. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let me have you, if you're physically able, let me ask everybody who can, would you please stand to your feet? I'm going to pray for these that, uh, that have raised their hands. And when I'm finished praying, Brittany's just going to play through a hymn of invitation on the piano. When she begins to play, if you raised your hand tonight uh, about living by faith, then may I invite you to do business with the Lord. You're certainly welcome to turn and kneel where you are, or you can come to the front row here and talk to the Lord, but don't, don't leave without doing business with God. If you raised your hand about needing to trust Christ, or you'd like to ask questions about it, while these are praying, then why don't you come and see Pastor? He'll be standing here towards the front. You come and see him, and let him get you connected with somebody, and you can trust Christ tonight. We'd be glad to help you with that. We'd love to. Father, in the name of Jesus, help these who come before you now. And they hear the request for this one that raised their hand regarding their need to trust in your Son. I pray, dear God, they'd be fully convinced of, Lord Jesus, who you are and that you can save them from their sins, change their life, and give them um, an eternal home with you. I pray, Lord, that uh, those who are still struggling through some things or perhaps aren't aware of areas where they're not living by faith or where feeling is pressing them instead of faith, leading them. I pray, dear God, that you just help us to be aware of this and to think through it. In Jesus' name I ask. Now, heads bowed, eyes closed, as Brittany begins to play on the piano, if God dealt in your heart, I invite you to do this with the Lord. If you need to be saved, you'd like to trust Christ, come to the pastor, he's right here, you can come talk to him, and he'll get you connected with somebody. If you'd like somebody to come with you, you can invite him to come with you.